SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and we pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. SACPA commits to assist reconciliation efforts by raising awareness of the ways past and present injustices can be reconciled. Let me, let me uh, introduce you to our speaker, who we are joyous to have with us today. It's Dr. Rob Sutherland, Professor of Neuroscience at the University of Lethbridge. And his talk is on how can we stem the, the tide of, can't even re read my writing, how can we stem the tide of age-related dementia? Let's all welcome Rob. Thanks very much, uh, Beth. And um, let me go back. No, I can't go back. There. So I appreciate the invitation to come and talk to this group. Uh, this is actually the third time I've talked to SACPA, the first time I've talked about age-related uh, dementia. Uh, and the reason why I'm so interested in talking in the community about dementia is it's the most important health problem faced by Canada, the US, and uh, Europe. Um, and the reason why it is such an important problem um, is the fact that it's directly related to aging. The older a population becomes, uh, the more uh, the prevalence of dementias, specifically Alzheimer's disease. So my goal today is to uh, point you to some of the current knowledge that we have about dementia. We know a great deal now. Uh, we didn't uh, 20 years ago. Uh, and it is possible to reduce your risk for developing dementia by doing a few straightforward, simple things. Uh, and I'd like to talk about that. Um, and those things will also be extremely important in containing costs uh, to our healthcare system uh, going forward. So a few um, facts that uh, point to the scope of the problem. Uh, Age-related dementia cases with Alzheimer's disease by being the most common will double in about 20 years. So we have a lot of cases that we know of now. That's going to double, twice as many. And the health care costs will triple. Uh, and I don't notice any provincial governments around here that are getting ready for that. Uh, they're simply not. Right now, so ignoring 20 years from now, right now, dementias are more costly than heart disease and cancer combined. Uh, we now know that in the United Kingdom, which has had a mature dementia strategy for many, many years, um, we know it's the leading cause of death uh, in the UK, uh, ahead of cardiovascular disease and cancer. Uh, and I think that's true in Alberta and in the South Zone as well. We're just very far behind in record keeping. Uh, we, we haven't adopted best practices in data recording. It's important to recognize that brain aging uh, is a spectrum. We have people who age very, very well um, and, and are sharp as a tack in the, in, in, at 105. Not very many, but we have those people. Uh, and uh, we have people who, when they reach their 40s, are showing age-related dementia. And we see everything in between. It's a very wide spectrum, and all parts of that spectrum are populated by us. Um, dementia isn't a disease. Uh, so it's a general term that captures a bunch of different diseases. And dementia refers to a cognitive impairment that's so severe that it interferes with daily life. So the person really can't live independently. Uh, at that point, we uh, diagnose the person with dementia. 75 cases, 75% uh, of the cases um, of dementia are Alzheimer's type dementia. Um, so Alzheimer's disease is far and away the most common form of age-related dementia. Here's the list of common symptoms. And except for seven and eight, 
um, the first six can show up as the primary or first symptom. It's not always memory problems, but memory problems are very commonly the first symptom. Uh, often there are um, mood changes that occur early. A uh, person starts showing more anxiety or depressive symptoms uh, than they had during middle age. Personality changes can be early. Difficulty planning, uh, showing behavioral flexibility, um, an inability to make decisions. This can be an early symptom. Um, eventually, most people lose the ability to perceive complex things, so they become uh, impaired at recognizing uh, faces or familiar places. Um, and they have difficulty with emotional expression. Uh, often, uh, emotional expression becomes divorced from the actual emotional context. Eventually, people will show difficulty in hygiene and dressing, uh, eating, drinking, and continence. Uh, so this is a, a fairly common uh, sequence, but the first six can pop up as the, the first symptom, not always memory. Dementia is poorly diagnosed, and I'll say very poorly diagnosed in the South Zone. Uh, often it's a family doctor uh, who makes the diagnosis, and I notice many older people now don't see a family doctor. Um, there's also diagnoses done by geriatricians, uh, and geriatricians are specialists in care for the elderly uh, and have uh, should have a number of tests that are applied uh, for making a diagnosis of dementia. Normally, people don't arrive at a geriatrician's office until they're already moderately demented, no longer able to live independently. Uh, and that's too late for many interventions. And then there's also um, memory clinics. We have one uh, in Lethbridge over at the University of Lethbridge. Uh, and a registered psychologist um, uh, designs the testing to evaluate uh, in detail the level of cognitive uh, performance or impairment. So I mentioned age is the biggest factor. One of the reasons why in parts of Asia and uh, Africa the rates of dementia are lower than here uh, has to do with the fact that we get very old. Um, we have a high probability of uh, being, you know, in our 80s, 90s, and more uh, when we die. And if you look at this graph, uh, especially at the uh, 90 or 95 plus, uh, it looks like about half of people um, will develop uh, Alzheimer's type dementia uh, if they live that long. And your risk uh, in each decade of age increases rather dramatically. Another thing to note in this graph is that women are much more susceptible to Alzheimer's disease than men. And that's not due to the fact that they live longer. It's actually um, a susceptibility problem that um, uh, is different between men and women. Um, here's a, an example of what uh, a brain, uh, Sunny, uh, over on the right, uh, who died uh, during pickleball um, with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and there's a healthy um, uh, brain. And part of what you notice is that at the end of life in Alzheimer's disease, the gaps between the ridges in the neocortex are very wide. And this turns out to be absolutely definitive for Alzheimer's disease. You don't need to go in and do a fancy neurochemical test or genetic test, just the width of the sulci, those valleys, is sufficient to identify uh, more than 90% of people with Alzheimer's disease. If you look inside the brain, uh, you can see on the right uh, that uh, there's lots of brain tissue that's missing. So um, neuropathology, loss of neurons, is a cardinal symptom of age-related dementias, including Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but it's not the only one. Uh, the other cardinal symptoms are related to two proteins that can be measured in brain or in blood or in cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, and these are uh, amyloid beta in the top left. Uh, and then in the bottom right, um, those long conical structures are um, 
not amyloid, they were pathological tau protein that formed tangles inside neurons. And by the time you reach that point, uh, that neuron would be functionally dead, if not completely moribund. We lose connections as well. So we have a buildup in two proteins, we lose neurons, and we also lose the fine connections between parts of the neocortex very gradually as the disease progresses. Um, this is an extremely significant graph, uh, and uh, it shows why, for example, I said that um, by the time somebody arrives at a geriatrician's office, it's too late to do anything. Um, Alzheimer's disease actually starts with amyloid beta, AB deposition, and it starts way, way before there's any symptoms. And it builds up almost to its maximum level when a person is showing very mild dementia, what we call mild cognitive impairment. So it's already maxed out uh, at the point that somebody is showing mild cognitive impairment. Um, tau, pathological tau, um, starts building up much later, and it's quite likely that it's the real perpetrator of the harm to neurons. Um, and by the time you end up with um, high levels of tau, you're moderately demented and, and simply can't look after yourself. Most of the work on new treatments has taken place where I have that uh, little uh, amyloid beta-42 immunization. Most of the uh, attempt to uh, measure the efficacy of treatments begins way, way too late. It needs to start over there um, before we actually have any evidence for uh, cognitive impairment. And I'll have more to say about that in a little bit. So I want to talk about the risk factors over the lifespan. Uh, and I've divided up the risk factors into later life. So for most of us here, that's right now, later life. Uh, and um, orange is midlife. Um, and blue is early life factors. Um, and green, orange, and blue are modifiable risk factors. That is, we can intervene, or we ourselves can do something uh, that will dramatically reduce the risk from each of these factors. The gray um, ones that I'm going to show you are potentially unmodifiable. So these are things that are there uh, very, very early. Um, and it lo it's looking like some of the risk factors interact with age, but I'll leave that alone for now. So let's talk about old age risk factors. And about 15% of the overall risk of Alzheimer's disease uh, depends upon risk factors present in old age. Uh, smoking, uh, clinical depression, physical or cognitive inactivity, hypertension, untreated, uh, diabetes, not properly controlled, uh, and brain injury, traumatic brain injuries. So if you were, when you hit age 62, to not smoke, treat any depression, remain physically active, summer and winter, um, control any hypertension, um, control any diabetic symptoms, and avoid traumatic brain injury in old age, so don't fall on the ice, um, you can reduce your overall risk by about 15%. The total amount of modifiable risk is about 35%. So the majority of the risk is actually earlier than old age. So it's too late really to have a big, big impact. And you can have an effect on 15%. Midlife is about 12%. Uh, and here I understand that your last speaker talked about hearing loss. Hearing loss, we don't have as much data on hearing loss as we do for some of the other factors, but the data we do have really speak to the importance of correcting any hearing loss in middle age. Too late for most of us now to begin to correct it. Uh, it needs to be corrected when you're in your 40s and 50s. Um, again, hypertension shows up in middle age. Uh, obesity shows up as a risk factor in middle age. Uh, cognitive and physical inactivity. Uh, sleep problems and again, uh, traumatic brain injury. So if you were perfect as a middle-ager in regard to these factors, 
you could reduce your risk by about 12%. Early life only accounts for about 8% of the risk factor. Um, the most uh, significant one here, statistically, is low educational attainment. Um, and, it, and it seems to be a continuous variable. Um, the less education, formal education you have, the higher is your risk of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and completing high school, completing post-secondary education, and it, getting an advanced degree all of these things uh, reduce the overall risk that's contained in the education uh, category. And in education, I include multilingualism. Uh, so learning second, third languages are uh, also very important uh, in regard to this risk. Traumatic brain injury, uh, cognitive and physical inactivity. And you know, a couple of generations ago, we didn't have very many children who were physically inactive, but we do now. The potentially unmodifiable risk factors account for about 65% of the overall risk of Alzheimer's disease. And these, most of them, are gene variants. Um, there's also some epigenetic factors that aren't directly inherited that modify the expression of good genes and, and make them um, ha have less beneficial effect. One of the most important genes is APOE4. Uh, that gene um, is involved in metabolizing fats, lipids, uh, and transporting lipids in the brain. And that one gene alone can account for 7% of the risk. Uh, and we're learning quite a lot about APOE4 right now. Some of the new treatments that are being evaluated preclinically are targeting lipid metabolism and lipid transport in the brain. Uh, and some of those are looking promising. Um, but if we think that there's only one Alzheimer's gene, we're wrong. There's 43 others. A and each time I give a talk, or each year that I give a talk, the number of identified genes goes up. Um, and this is the majority of the risk for Alzheimer's disease. Um, here are clusters of the genes uh, that we talk about. The top left, uh, we have almost certain um, Alzheimer's disease if you have any of those gene variants, and there's three of them. Um, if you go down towards the right, there's a lower probability of developing Alzheimer's disease, and if you have two of these bad APOE4 alleles, very unlucky, um, you have a very high risk of uh, Alzheimer's disease. And then we get down to the more common uh, variants, they actually bring with them very little overall risk, each one of them. But if you sum all these up, you end up with what's known as a polygenic risk score for Alzheimer's disease. So if you want now, for a few hundred dollars, you can find out exactly what your polygenic risk is. How many of you would do that? Okay, the rest of you would rather not know. <laughs> Uh, an interesting, um, uh, James Watson, who was um, co-discoverer co of the structure of DNA, uh, he had his genome done and he refused to be told what any of the risk factors are at any of these gene loci. Did not want to know, so you're, you're in good company. <laughs> or actually, maybe bad company, I don't know. Um, okay, so... The good news is that these clusters of genes that we can't really do anything about right now um, fall into four um, groupings. There are genes that are related to uh, amyloid, beta amyloid, the uh, pathological form, and these are the focus of the antibody therapies that are available right now. So there's two that have been improved in the U.S. Um, so far, I think oh, still only one um, is available in Canada. And that little graph I showed you about when amyloid beta starts building up, when should the immunization against amyloid beta be? Yeah, as early as possible. As early as possible. Uh, not, not when you're showing symptoms uh, of dementia. Um, tau, we now have lots of antibody therapies that are being evaluated preclinically for pathological tau. 
Um, right at the moment, they don't look as promising, actually, as the amyloid antibody therapies, uh, but uh, they're newer uh, on the research scene. Um, there are drugs that are being developed to modify lipid metabolism and transport of fats in the brain. Uh, our innate immunity system seems to go horribly wrong uh, in Alzheimer's disease, the microglia, which are the single cell most important for innate immunity in the brain, start treating um, some fragments of neurons that have been damaged by proteins, um, start um, gobbling them up and contributing to the loss of uh, neurons. And there was a really uh, cool study that was just published yesterday uh, that found 12 brains, this was a study done in the Netherlands, of people who died quite, uh, um, quite old and who had clear Alzheimer's pathology in terms of amyloid beta and pathological tau, but they had no dementia at all, despite the fact that they were in their 90s. And the one thing that was pretty clear is they had wimpy microglia. The microglia they had were not aggressively gobbling things up. They were just relaxed, sitting around. Um, and so that may actually be a good target uh, in the future. And then the final cluster are genes that are involved in endocytosis. That's the gobbling up of debris uh, and pathological material by cells, usually microglia. Okay. There are lots of other smaller risks. Uh, probably the one that um, uh, is not discussed nearly enough is socioeconomic status. Uh, that can really modulate um, uh, risk of other factors. Um, uh, multilingualism is protective, uh, and some version of the Mediterranean diet, and there's now many versions of the Mediterranean diet, uh, very low in red meat, lots of um, seafood, um, olive oil, not uh, dairy fats, and so on. Good sleep hygiene is protective. Avoiding heavy drinking uh, and avoiding abstaining entirely seem to be um, protective. Uh, and it seems like all vaccinations, including the annual flu vaccine, is protective. So the more consistent someone has been throughout their life in receiving vaccinations, the lower the risk of uh, Alzheimer's disease. And um, we seem to be going backwards on that one in Alberta. Um, migraine with aura uh, increases risk of Alzheimer's disease. There's a little bit of um, um, pathological events that occur during a migraine aura. Uh, and air and noise pollution uh, increase risk. So people who live near um, busy uh, roadways and so on, or downtown. Current treatments, um, and uh, in the last couple of minutes, I'll say something about this. Um, cholinesterase inhibitors are general cognitive enhancers. They don't have anything specific to do in relation to Alzheimer's pathology. Um, NMDA blockers, memantine is uh, the main one, do tend to reduce the amount of neuronal damage that's taking place. Uh, and so a combination of cholinesterase inhibitors and memantine uh, is a very good idea early in dementia, all the way through to um, moderate dementia, and it should increase the quality of life for most people if both of those are done. Um, and you'll be happy to know that uh, Alberta Health Services South Zone has the lowest rate of prescribing these two uh, kinds of treatments. Um, physicians don't do it. Uh, Alberta's low, and this is the lowest place in Canada. Uh, people are not getting the medications that we know produce some benefit. In the US, I mentioned two antibodies. These remove amyloid. Um, they're probably um, moderately uh, impactful early in the dementia process, not so much later. Um, and I think really the future is going to be a combination of modifying all of the modifiable risk factors that you can, and there'll be a cocktail of different drugs, at least in the initial uh, phase of effective uh, treatment, that involve targeting the five 
areas where genes are causing trouble in the progression of uh, Alzheimer's disease. Okay, um, with some summing up, uh, with what we know right now, we can, we can prevent a third of the cases of Alzheimer's disease. Um, it, and I don't know why any uh, enlightened health service wouldn't want to uh, get out there and ambitiously um, pursue uh, these preventative steps that are pretty straightforward and easy. I think we also should give people a break um, who are elderly and starting to show symptoms. Um, most of the risk that they uh, have experienced over their life, they can't do anything about. It's not like they can bend that curve when they hit age 75. Um, they can only have a modest effect on that. Um, and so it, it really is not a matter of individual responsibility, I don't think. Um, and the effective treatments are going to require significant investments in research. Um, dementia research receives far less than um, the uh, treatment of cardiovascular disease or cancer receive, um, despite it costing uh, the health system far more. Um, and I guess I'll just mention one more thing. We're the only province where the province does not invest in an Alzheimer's society. Every other province in Canada, the government supports the Alzheimer's society. This is the main contact point where people learn uh, who they can consult about diagnosis and treatments, um, where they learn about the sequence of services that are available as a person becomes more severely affected and our province doesn't support it. They do have a dementia strategy in the province of Alberta. It was put in place in 2017, seven years ago. There was a progress report published late 2018, and then something changed in 2019. <laughs> and there hasn't been a single thing done since then. Nothing, despite the fact that there's some hard-won facts about how to uh, reduce our overall risk. And I think I'll stop there and invite questions. Thank you to the LSCO who provide this room free of charge. Of course, your uh, going to the cafeteria help, certainly helps LSCO. So thank you for patronizing the lunch counter. Thank you for the, to the University of Lethbridge for their ongoing support, and the Lethbridge Herald and other media who are here today for their coverage. Thanks to Rogers TV and Ryan here for recording our sessions, available both on TV and our SACPA.ca archives. And next week's topic will be John Doan, University of Lethbridge, speaking about a rural medical teaching school at the University of Lethbridge. What are the benefits and challenges? And now back to our speaker for questions and answers. I see people are already lining up in an orderly fashion. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rob. Please welcome Rob back. Hi, Rob. Henning Mundel is my name, and thank you very much, and I'm so glad that it's recorded because it'll appear later and we can, uh, on uh, YouTube and so on, we can go through the individual things. I have two questions for you. One is, you mentioned, a, uh, you showed a graph where the progress to, uh, towards Alzheimer's uh, is quite a bit higher for women than men. Uh, of the various genes contributing to Alzheimer's, is there a majority of them related to recessives on the X chromosome? So therefore, and the, y, uh, the men <laughs> wouldn't as likely have them, or a number of them? So that's one question. The other one, where can I get tested for my, uh, here in Lethbridge in Southern Alberta for genetic makeup? Okay. So the first question is, um, probably there's no sex difference in the susceptibility genes in Alzheimer's disease. It's not probably um, a gene expression difference between the sexes. Um, what it seems to be related to, I think, two things. Um, one is that um, 
There's an inflammatory process that triggers microglia and some of these other brain changes. That inflammatory, inflammatory process gets really engaged during menopause. So uh, women undergoing menopause, so that perimenopausal period, uh, end up having spikes of inflammation uh, that takes place in the brain. <clears throat> and current thinking is that that is a trigger. <clears throat> the other thing I know is true in southern Alberta, um, where records that I saw now a few years ago um, showed that dementia was the second leading cause of death. Um, it was mainly in women who were living in rural settings, who were relatively isolated from social interaction and, uh, and lots of activities. And, and I think that may affect more women than men. Uh, and if you want to get genetic testing, uh, Alberta Health Services won't do it for you. That's probably no surprise. Um, <laughs> Um, but there are companies uh, that will do a full genome screen now, um, not just 23andMe or the Ancestry ones, but they do a full uh, genome scan for a few hundred dollars. And, and I'm not going to advertise for any of them. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, Rob, for a very good presentation, a very interesting one. I'm Maureen Hawkins. Mm -hmm. You mentioned immunization against amyloid B. Uh, sorry, you mentioned um, immunization, and you pointed out that it's usually too late. Is there any point in having it done prophylactically earlier? Yes, there is. Um, <laughs> and so uh, what I will say is that uh, I'm not fully convinced that the the technology is as effective as it should be. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm not sure whether the cost benefits would, uh, would weigh out in favor of doing it early. Um, but once they have truly effective uh, passive antibody treatments, which won't cause as many side effects, I think it would be worthwhile, particularly in people who, for a variety of reasons, are at risk. Certainly in those people, it would be good early say, you know, in teen years. And more and more we keep hearing about all kinds of problems connected to inflammation within the brain and within the body. Um, it would seem to me that these things happen very often without our even knowing we have inflammation. Is this something that can be checked for once in a while, a year, in your yearly physical or something, and see what can be done about it? It seems like it's a source of a great many problems. Yeah, so one of the problems with doing testing in relation to Alzheimer's disease, testing uh, for in inflammatory markers, is that they're not very specific. So if you have, um, you know, if you have arthritis or if you have um, any kind of uh, skin condition, uh, all of those things cause an increase in inflammatory markers. Um, if we could go directly into the brain and like take a little core sample um, and measure it in the brain, that would be certainly more valid. But at the moment, we don't have really good uh, ways of doing that uh, that, are, that are worth it, worth the risk. I will say that the inflammatory processes that go on perimenopausally can be controlled by replacement hormone therapy. And there's far better ones than were tested back in the 1970s that produced cancer risk. Thank you, Dr. Sutherland. I, I haven't a, a question, but I have a, a comment. I'll, I'll get to that, yes. Uh, I'm at the age where I have to work my driver's license to remember my name, so. Um, um, I'm uh, Doug Schindler. I was the <clears throat> last president of the regional hospital before the government decided to dismiss the local boards and my position disappeared. <clears throat> But prior to that, I, uh, I served three years as a Canadian representative on the American College of Hospital Administrators. And the, uh, the first meeting I attended, uh, there was uh, 
a group of 20, uh, 19 from various regions uh, from the United States and one from Canada. And at the first meeting, because um, um, several of us were new to the committee, we had to go around the table and, and identify ourselves. And when it came to my term, and I said, my position at Lethbridge, Alberta, the master, the chairman of the committee said, Lethbridge, Alberta, said, we have heard some amazing results from the neuroscience department of the University of Lethbridge. And, uh, and, <laughs> and right around the 19 American reps all had the same observation, and they wanted me to talk about it. Well, unfortunately, I have no clinical background, so I, I pleaded ignorant to what was going on. But I thought the compliment of 19 people from over across the United States knew about the wonderful work being done by the Neurosciences Department of the University of Lethbridge was something very important. I congratulate you, and thank you again. <laughs> Uh, Sandy Gibson, and I've just got a couple of very quick questions. I think I've been to every presentation you've done, particularly in the last little while, anyway. A uh, couple, though, um, learning another language. I'm really bad at all of that sort of stuff. Can, uh, is it as effective if you learn to read and write rather than speak? So that's the first question. The second one, um, playing an instrument or learning a musical instrument, is it as effective as, say, maybe learning another language? That's it. Okay, um, certainly the number of modalities that you master a language in is important uh, and, and would contribute to the, the benefit. And I, I use the word language loosely. Music, if you learn to read music and transfer it into meaningful uh, play, that, that's a language. Mathematics is a language. If you get deeply into chess or some other games, it's a language. Uh, and so all of those things count and are beneficial. Fiona okay. Jacobs. So my question has to sort of follow on the whole issue of inflammation. And, and I'm wondering, and maybe it's too early in the research game to talk about this, but the role of COVID because there's evidence now that it's infiltrated the brain and it causes inflammation in that. And the other question I have is maybe you could explain the connection between migraine with aura and how that affects the brain in terms of Alzheimer's. Sure. Thanks, Leona. Um, so COVID and several other uh, viruses do find the brain to be pretty hospitable. Um, and so probably any of you who've had COVID, especially if you had it early on, may have encountered um, changes in smell. Um, and certainly the first couple of strains of COVID um, did bring that about. And that actually is um, marked by entry of the virus up through the nasal epithelium and into the brain. And we know it can live not only in the olfactory areas, but in the areas of the brain that um, are involved in forming new memories each day. Um, those seem to be the two um, most important places. Uh, we don't have enough data yet to say for sure um, that um, COVID will increase risk of um, Alzheimer's disease, but I'll bet a thousand dollars it does. And, um, and it's so similar to some other um, viruses that uh, we do know increase risk. And so having COVID vaccination up to the recommended point of um, boosters uh, probably will be preventative of, um, or will reduce risk of dementia. Um, and if any of you do have um, long-term changes in olfaction <coughs> that happened right after COVID, I have a research project that I, I would like to enroll you in. So contact me at the university. We're actively pursuing this question right now. Oh, migraines. So I don't, the aura is 
uh, something that occurs during vasoconstriction. Uh, and so that's the initial triggering event. Well, that's the event that occurs when it's first noticeable that you're having a migraine. And um, that vasoconstriction can produce um, disruption of small vessels that simply aren't getting enough um, blood supply to be healthy. Uh, and so many people who have, I don't want to get people upset, but many people who have migraine with aura, and I'm one of them, um, will have these little white matter hyperintensities, like a little bit of salt grains through their cortex, especially if you have visual aura or up back in the visual parts of the brain. Um, and there's some linkage between small vessel disease and Alzheimer's disease. So it's probably through that route. Most people, by the time they get into their 60s, have white matter hyperintensity, so it's not definitive of anything. Barb Phillips, thank you, Dr. Sutherland, for, for sharing your knowledge and research with us. Uh, it's amazing, and, and it's a gift to, that you share it with SACPA. My observations over the last 10 years here in Lethbridge, I've done uh, PET therapy at the, a couple different memory care units in Lethbridge, and some, a lot of the residents still the same one. So I've seen the progression of, of the disease. But I, I have noted, and maybe you could comment on this observation, that uh, that in particular one, one resident, it takes very little work on my part, mostly the work is done by the dog, will trigger her memories of back in Yorkshire in England 50 years ago, uh, yet she could not tell me, or she will tell me, that she hasn't had breakfast an hour before, and that, yeah, she has rotten treatment and all this sort of thing. Uh, so yes, how, how the, how, I, and I would say for her it is a disease. I've seen the progression, and in particular, so much worse when I went back after COVID had, and I wasn't allowed to go. Thank you. Sure, that's a, a very good observation, and many people who work with dementia, people living with dementia, um, will have noticed similar things. Sometimes it's music, sometimes it's dogs, sometimes it's a, a birthday party event. Anything that is sort of arousing and engaging will actually cause some uh, neurotransmitters that we call neuromodulators to start squirting out um, the contents of their synapses in, in the cortex. And that makes previously difficult to access memories stored in neuronal networks be accessible again. The, mo the modulators sort of push up the overall level of excitation, so the person is better able to engage with those networks. Um, th so there's nothing in particular about uh, pets. Uh, if you find, uh, if you are living with someone who's living with dementia, anything that they find very engaging will actually be beneficial uh, through the mild to moderate uh, stages. Um, I think I'll just leave it at that. There, there is a big difference between recent memory and remote memories. Um, and so recent memories are the ones that are nearly always completely trashed um, in Alzheimer's disease. Carefully. Um, I've <clears throat> had a lot of experience with dementia non-medically. Um, my husband was diagnosed in 2004, and like you say, the education was certainly there. He was a three-degree mathematician, uh, and he lived another six years. Now, I've heard you, through this excellent presentation, refer to Alzheimer's and dementia, and my training, uh, in as much as they give, give it to the families, was that there were several other kinds of dementia. And there was a frontal lobal, and there was, uh, they finally decided they'd put him under the Lewy bodies one because he didn't seem to fit anywhere else. Um, just what you only mentioned the two, have they got more specific on the different types now? 
Yep, that's a good question. And um, a couple of things are worth noting. In that 25% that's not Alzheimer's disease, uh, we have a, a group of about a dozen. They're m much less common, so Lewy body's not as common. Uh, frontotemporal dementia is pretty common, so uh, one of our premiers, not our current one, um, had frontotemporal dementia. <laughs> Um, and he showed all the signs of frontotemporal dementia, shouting at people, doing outrageous things, and, and so on. So he, he had frontotemporal dementia in office. Um, and so uh, there are many, and you know, in a 25 minute talk, I didn't want to uh, dwell on any of the others. Uh, there's a kind that shows up in association with Parkinson's disease. Um, Vascular dementia uh, is either separate or sometimes coexists with Alzheimer's disease. So um, what I will say is except for uh, a couple, um, they respond to the same um, risk factors that I described for Alzheimer's disease. Maybe the relative risks change a little bit, but the same things that are beneficial in Alzheimer's disease are beneficial in other dementias. Uh, so social activity, cognitive activity, uh, physical exercise, all of those things are great in the other dementias as well. Okay. Thank you, Ken Sears. Um, earlier on in your, your comments, you made a reference to, just in passing to the fact that increased intellectual and academic activity seems to counteract some of the uh, onsets of dementia. Um, has anyone looked at if there's a similar impact on craftsmen and tradesmen? Because their day-to-day -day work would involve at least as much immediate intellectual activity over the course of their lifetime. So if it's simply your brain's working a lot, this might not, uh, you know, there might be other factors involved here. So I don't know of any research study that's been done specifically on trades and crafts. Um, as you mentioned, you can imagine that that could be, especially if you're creative and learning new techniques and so forth, be similar to academic uh, work. Uh, the advantage of some of the trades and some of the uh, crafts is you also get physical activity at the same time, uh, which would be very beneficial. But I don't think I've seen a study on that topic. Good question. Hi, I'm Violet Meekma. Uh, what caught my eye was a slide about obesity. Um, I believe it said that there's a decreased risk in middle age and an increased risk as you get older. No? Did I read that wrong? Oh, <laughs> okay. Decreased risk older, yes. Okay, I said that backwards. Uh, so I'm interested if you could expand a little bit on that and tell me, and maybe I should get this test so I can go out and eat whatever I want. Does that... <laughs> and then die of heart disease. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we don't understand this very well. It's popped up in many studies now. Um, so the, the worst outcome in terms of risk for Alzheimer's disease is in people who were obese in middle age who become very skinny in old age. They have high risk. Um, people who were obese in middle age have a higher risk um, and then that gets neutralized if they maintain that obesity through uh, the elderly years. Um, the first paper that uh, really systematically evaluated this actually suggested that there might be, in just the same way as if you use skeletal muscles, there's um, trophic factors that um, enter blood circulation and have a beneficial effect on the brain. There may be in fat too. There are a lot of... Um, circulating factors coming out of certain types of fat that cross the blood-brain barrier and may have some benefit in reducing inflammation. Hi, my name's Ian Hurdle. Uh, one observation I've seen when I used to look after people that were injured, some of them as a result of the injury and I thought it was adrenaline or people looking after them, they seem to move out of the severe dementia to a mild dementia for a while. 
and it was amazing to me. My politically incorrect question is, we're facing this tsunami, why is Alberta not even recognizing it? Well, I did mention that in 2017 there was a dementia strategy created in the province of Alberta that was actually pretty, you know, well formed uh, as a strategy. It was inspired by the UK uh, system. What happened in 2019 is your guess. Um, <laughs> it, it hasn't been taken up as an important issue. But maybe now that we have four health services, it'll be better. <laughs> I'm going to take the prerogative of the chair and ask a question, Bev Mundell-Atherstone. Okay, I'd like to know, you mentioned that um, too much alcohol, binge drinking, and abstinence of uh, drinking are, are both no-goes. Uh, so I'd like to know how much can we drink and be okay? <laughs> and then I'd like to know what effect does do um, street drugs have on dementia? So no one has collected really good data on street drugs, so I'm just gonna set that aside, um, except high doses of some serotonergic hallucinogens cause uh, vasoconstriction and, and uh, neuronal death and would push you in the direction of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so what was your first question? Oh, drinking. <laughs> so we don't know. It, it, we know in respect to heart health, we don't know in respect to brain health. So it, it's probably something less than one glass of wine for women uh, a day. Uh, and maybe twice as much for men would be okay. Um, and you know that there's lots of genetic factors that modify risk from ethanol. So you need to know your genome. Uh, Terry Shellington is my name. A wonderful presentation, just wonderful. Um, I don't get headaches of any kind or sort, or maybe I'd know the answer to this question, but I wonder if you would explain what migraines with aura is, and maybe say a tad more about the connection between migraines and dementia. So m migraines per se, without aura, don't increase risk. So only with aura increases risk. And you can have migraine aura without any headache. What's, what's aura, migraine? Oh, sorry. So for most people, an aura is a, a, a visual phenomenon that starts off usually rather small and expands in your visual space. Often it's um, jagged edges that are scintillating and might be colorful, depending upon what part of the cortex is scintillating. Um, other people will have um, changes in sensation on some part of their body. Their face might become numb um, during the process. It normally lasts between about five and 20 minutes. So it's, it, it's a positive symptom that occurs, usually before the onset of headache. Uh, and those of you who get migraine aura um, and then headache can reduce the um, for most people, the intensity of the headache by uh, two double espressos really quickly during the aura. Okay. It does tend to counteract the vascular response. And my name is Mark Edel. In a couple of weeks, we'll have Dr. Matisse speak to us on the effects of the microflora, gut microflora on brain health. I'm just wondering, is that part of your group? Is Alzheimer's also part of that study? Yes, Chelsea Matisse, who will be speaking in two weeks, um, works in our neuroscience department. She's a postdoctoral fellow uh, and has been studying um, Alzheimer's symptoms in some of our, our mouse transgenic models. And it seems like you definitely get a, um, from conditions like colitis, you definitely see an impact on um, brain health in an Alzheimer's model. Now I've just stolen her thunder. 
Knut Peterson is my name. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for your presentation, Rob. It was very informative, and it's great to see a big crowd. That means that you're all reasonably okay. You remember to come here. <laughs> uh, my question relates to when you, when you look around the world, certain diets, uh, for example, in Japan and other places where the diet might affect the amount of Alzheimer's and dementia among the population. Could you uh, talk a little bit about that? Yeah, these are so-called blue zones. Uh, there are a few of them around the world. Um, I visited one last summer, uh, Sardinia. Really hard work um, uh, visiting that uh, island in the Mediterranean. Um, but th they're notable for a number of reasons. The people are very physically active uh, all through life. Um, there's very little red meat that they eat. Um, they tend to use non-dairy fats and oils uh, in their food. And they, they eat lots of raw foods, lots of raw vegetables, fruit. Um, seafood they eat um, large amounts of in all of these blue zones, or most of these blue zones. Um, so I'd say it's the combination of factors that are in that risk list that these people have, um, they exemplify um, the middle age proper modification of risk. Leona Jacobs again. Two questions again. One is following on the business about diet. Is there a geographic difference given that we're on the prairies and f not necessarily attuned to eating seafood? Um, more beef, harder beef, right? And the second thing is about mycoglio um, because they're the housekeeping, they're the housekeepers of the brain, right? And so if, we, if they're overactive and we're trying to calm them down, what about just the normal housekeeping that happens in the brain with them? Yeah, so um, just to clarify a little bit, in the brains of Alzheimer's um, uh, people in the Netherlands, in the study that I talked about with um, calm microglia, in the brains of people who are showing clear cognitive impairment, the microglia were very, very active, excessively active, as if the brain was infected with something. Um, and, and so in the 12 people who were, you know, fantastic agers, even though they had Alzheimer's uh, pathology in the brain, their microglia were just relaxed in a normal, ready state. They weren't triggered or activated. So they were ready if something happened. So if somebody, uh, say, received a, a viral load uh, into the brain uh, somehow, uh, they would be there and turned on. So it wasn't that they were asleep, they were just relaxed. Yeah, more red meat, bad. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just absolutely clear that people who have l lots of dairy and, and lots of red meat in their diet and are low in things like olive oil and um, seafood, it doesn't matter where they are, they increase their risk. This will be the last question. Uh, Henning Mundel here, and uh, to fool the moderator and the presenter, it's not a question. By way of a compliment, I'm going to address the moderators and, uh, the, and the board of SACPA. Can you please ask future speakers to get a copy of Dr. Sutherland's presentation and see that a font that can be read part way down the room, not just on your laptop, is doable. Thank you. Do you have a take home comment for our audience? So 15 years ago, when I started doing any work at all on Alzheimer's disease, um, things were really bleak. Things were terrible. There were really uh, no good studies that told us exactly what was going on in the brain. 
Uh, there were no good studies that had identified treatments that would be beneficial. Um, and, um, and now we know how to reduce risk by about 35%. So if everyone in this room got really serious, um, we could reduce the rate of dementia in southern Alberta. And now there are new formulations for treatment that are coming along that are promising. And I'll just give two more final points. One is that in a really good series of studies on exercise and cognitive activity, people who had already entered mild cognitive impairment, who embraced a regular exercise regimen and became more socially and cognitively active, uh, their dementia went backwards. They went from mild cognitive impairment to no impairment. So you can actually bend it quite a bit, but only early on. Um, and the final thing, in some countries in Europe that have been a little more wise uh, in their dementia strategy, um, the rate of dementia is going down. So I think 15 years ago I couldn't say anything like that, but I can now. Well, Rob, you've ended on a very positive note, and it's very exciting. Thank you for presenting to us your cutting-edge research. Let's all thank Rob. Thank you.